You look great. You look ready to study God's Word. Am I right? Am I right? All right. Well, let's do that. Turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 as we continue to make our way through this series. We're going to conclude this series next week. This is our fifth week in this series called The Names of God as we've been studying the names of God. And I hope as we have gone through this series, you have learned a few different things about what God is like how God operates, and then how you can know Him better in this relationship that He calls us to. So I'm going I'm to give you a little quiz, all right? School is in session. Class is now in session. So we're going to review the different names. I want to see how much you guys have learned. So first name that we looked at, week one, Jehovah Jireh. What does Jehovah Jireh mean? All right, I heard it. The Lord will provide. Week two, Jehovah Rapha. Class, what does Rapha mean? Jehovah Rapha. The Lord that heals. Very good. I, I heard the same voice on that number two, so I'm going I'm to need to hear some different voices on this. Week three was Jehovah Nisi. Good job. The Lord is my banner. Sounding, you can sound confident when you give, give these answers here. And then last week was Jehovah Saba. What does Jehovah Saba mean? The Lord of hosts, very good class, the Lord of hosts. Week five is Jehovah Rohi. Everybody say Rohi. Sounds like kind of like a military call, like Rohi, but it's uh, biblical. And Jehovah Rohi means the Lord, my shepherd. You might have picked up on that if you're very familiar with Psalm 23. It's the very first phrase of the, this chapter, Psalm 23. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. In the Hebrew, Yahweh or Jehovah Rohi. It's a very precious name we're going to look, out, look at tonight and um, dive into. We have a lot to go over. I'm really excited about what the Lord might uh, reveal and teach to us tonight. Uh, but first, let's start by reading this psalm together, Psalm 23. And then we'll pray and then we'll dive in. Psalm 23 was written by David. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. There it is, Jehovah Rohi. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. God, we're here tonight to learn from you, and so we pray that you would teach us as we learn from your word, as we read and study your word, Lord. Be our teacher. Uh, open up our eyes and our ears to hear from you tonight, Lord. I pray that any distractions maybe that were... Uh, in our day today, anything that just caused us to, I don't know, be frustrated or, or be discouraged, I pray that you would just kind of set those aside and that you would calm our hearts to hear from you tonight, Lord, that we might learn more about you through this name as you reveal in Scripture, Jehovah Rohi. So we, we commit our Bible study to you, God, and we just simply ask that you would teach us tonight, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said together, amen and amen. So the 23rd Psalm, it was written by King David. Now this is the David we learned about last week. The same David who slayed Goliath the giant. This is that David who is now writing Psalm 23. At this point, it's believed that he's now king over Israel. And he is kind of reminiscing on his days as a shepherd boy as he writes this psalm. Now the 23rd Psalm is probably one of the most familiar psalms uh, in all of the Bible. Um, even people who don't know Jesus or don't profess to, be, profess to be Christians, they probably are familiar with a lot of the words from Psalm 23, uh, mainly because Psalm 23 is written in, uh, is, is read aloud at different funerals. Uh, but Psalm 23 is not a psalm about death, but rather it's a psalm about life. It's about how we are like sheep and God is our shepherd who lovingly, tenderly takes care of us. And so we see this name of God right here in the very first, first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. So if David calls God his shepherd, then what is that implying about David? That he's a sheep. 
So if David recognizes that God is my shepherd, David is implying within this passage, I am God's sheep as God leads me as my shepherd. And therefore, we as believers in the Lord can identify as sheep. And all throughout the Bible, uh, people are identified as sheep. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Psalm 93, 13 says, Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise your name forever. So those are just two verses out of multiple verses in the Bible that compare people to sheep. So the Bible makes it clear God is our shepherd. We are his sheep. Are we clear on that point? God's our shepherd. We're his sheep. And just so you know, us being compared to sheep, that's not a compliment. Okay, uh, that's actually not a compliment. It is very fitting, but sheep are probably the dumbest creatures that God has ever created. I mean, the dumbest animals. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about sheep here so that we can know a little bit more about ourselves. Uh, some facts here. First of all, this is you. All right. This is your Instagram selfie. All right. But a little bit of uh, information about sheep. Number one, sheep are senseless. Sheep are senseless animals. They have no idea where they're going. They can't find water. They can't find food on their own. They're senseless animals. They get lost very easily. Uh, they have no clue where they are or how to find their way home. Uh, as I mentioned, they can't find their, their way to food or water on their own. Uh, sheep travel in groups. And so when one sheep moves, the other sheep just move. And they don't even know why they move, but they all just move together. There was a USA Today article that ran a couple years ago. It was an article about a, a, a flock of sheep in Turkey. And 1,500 sheep ran off a cliff together and died. Because one stupid sheep went over to the side of the cliff, just like, well, it doesn't, doesn't look too bad, decided to jump, and then all the other dumb sheep were just like, well, if he's going, I guess I'll just go. And they just started all kind of hopping off the cliff together. The funny thing is, is that out of the 1,500 sheep that ran off the cliff, only 450 of them died. You know why? Because the first 450 plunged to their death, and then the rest is just like falling on top of cotton. It's just like all piling on each other. And so 450 died, and then the rest, they survived. Because one sheep decided it was a good idea to jump off a cliff. So the others just followed. They're senseless creatures. They have no clue where they're going or why they go where they go. Sheep, they're also defenseless. They're also defen defenseless creatures. Okay, in, in all of the animal kingdom, you know, other creatures and other animals, in defense, when there's a predator, okay, they either can change colors, or maybe they run real fast, or maybe they swim underwater. Sheep, nothing, okay? They don't, there's nothing intimidating about a sheep. They, they can't defend themselves in, in any way. When they're scared, when they, when they have a predator coming, all they do is they just gather together in a group and they just, bah, they just bleat. That's all they know how to do to defend themselves. So there's nothing scary or intimidating about a sheep. They can't defend themselves. They can't do anything cool like show their teeth or change colors like other animals do to defend themselves. If they fall on their backs, they can't get up. Do you know that? So a sheep who falls on their back just is staying there and hanging out till their shepherd comes and pulls them back up. So they fall on their backs. They can't get up. They're defenseless creatures, extremely vulnerable to predatory animals. Uh, sheep are also fearful. They're very fear fearful animals. The only thing they really have going for them is they actually have exceptional hearing. But it's kind of to their downfall because every little noise they hear, they're just kind of freaking out. All right, they, 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 they actually have really good uh, peripheral vision because, yeah, as you can kind of see, their, their eyes are kind of on the side of their head, but they lack good depth perception. So if someone's kind of coming up on them, they like have no clue like how close they are. They're just kind of freaking out as they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And, and they're really scared and they're really fearful. And because they can see real well out of the sides of their head, because they're always scared and fearful, they're looking, they're looking uh, to the side. They, they walk in zigzag. They don't walk straight. So they're kind of just walking like this as they're checking their backs to make sure no one's coming. So they're really fearful creatures. 
They, they really have uh, nothing going for them here. Very fearful. And then finally, uh, they're also very dirty, very dirty creatures. Uh, sheep actually produce, um, naturally secrete this oil called lanolin. So everything that they come in contact to just kind of sticks to them. Uh, different debris, different stuff, you know, different you know, feces or whatever, they're, they're coming around. Because of this lanolin oil, um, it kind of makes you just like a walking flannel board. So they're just walking around, they're just kind of contracting anything that they come across or come around, and so they're very dirty animals. Uh, they're, they're, they're very smelly and stinky. Okay, and, and so it is with us, as sheep are senseless and defenseless and fearful and dirty. Okay, there's no, no, no wonder the Bible compares us to sheep, because we in life often feel senseless. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like you just lack direction in life? Like you just don't know where you're going? You don't know who to date or what job to take or what next step to take in life? And you kind of just feel like you have a lack of direction. You feel a little bit senseless. You know, sometimes uh, I've often felt defenseless or fearful about life or about my future. Fearful of the unknown. What's coming next? Where will I be in five years? Where will I be in 10 years? Am I ever gonna get the right job? Or the job that I went to school and paid thousands of dollars to get a degree in, am I now going to find a job that now meets that degree? And, and you become fearful and you become anxious in life, just like sheep experience different fear. And then obviously, spiritually speaking, have you ever felt dirty because of your sin? And the guilt or the shame that you kind of carry around and everywhere you go, kind of just feel like a walking flannel board. You can't make right decisions. Everything bad just kind of sticks to you because you've been making poor choices and going to places you shouldn't go. And you kind of just pick up along the way just more dirt and more shame. And it just piles up. You just feel dirty. You feel dirty in your sin. The great news here is that David recognizes the Lord as his great shepherd. So enough talking about us. Let's talk about the shepherd. Let's see how the Lord operates in our lives and in our world as David makes these different comparisons and he, he identifies as a sheep in the realm of God's flock. God, you're my shepherd. And so we can take great comfort in knowing that God will operate as our shepherd. And we're going to walk through a, a couple of different attributes here. So let's examine the different characteristics about God as he's identified by David as a shepherd. So the very first verse, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Rohi. I shall not want. I shall not want. I always was confused by that phrase when I was a kid. I shall not want. I shall not want means I, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything else in life. I lack no good thing. I have all that I need. So what this tells us about the character of God is that God provides. I have all that I need in Christ. All that I need is sufficient in the Lord. Everything that I've been seeking and looking for in a thousand other places, I can find in the Lord. I have nothing else that I need. The Lord provides. This is what it tells us about His character. Verse 2, it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I find it interesting here. David says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. You know that sheep actually won't lie down on their own volition. Not until the shepherd feeds them well and makes sure that their environment is safe will then sheep lie down. And he says, You lead me beside still waters. You know that sheep won't drink from running water because they're fearful as they're seeing uh, rivers running. They won't drink from it. And I mean, it makes sense. If you tried swimming with 20 sweaters on, that would kind of make you a little bit fearful too. So sheep, they're like, I'm not taking a drink of this running water in the case that I fall in. So David knows this as a shepherd himself, and he says, the Lord leads me beside still waters. So it talks about this leadership of the Lord. In verse 3 it says, He leads me in paths of righteousness. 
This speaks about God's leadership in our, in our lives, how he desires to lead us. So characteristic number two about the Lord is he, he desires to lead. He leads if we submit to his leadership. If we allow the Lord to lead our lives. And then I love verse three also. It says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. Did any of you come to young adults kind of just feeling dry? Or feeling spiritually empty? Feeling kind of weary? Because the Lord, a characteristic of our shepherd, is that he restores. He restores our dry spirits. He fills us up when we're dry. This is God's heart for you as your shepherd. He desires to provide. He desires to lead us. He desires to fill us and to restore us. And a major problem, in my opinion, okay? I want you to listen up on to, up, I want you to listen to me up on this one, okay? A major problem with our generation, in my opinion, is that we have given other people and other things the right to be our shepherd in these regards. Okay, in other words, we have given other people or other things the right to take God's place as our provider, as our leader, and as our restorer. So what do I mean by this? Let me break it down a little bit. So let's start with number one, provide. So you say you're not happy in life. Not happy in life, not fulfilled in life. Here's how the world attempts to provide and meet your needs. Well, you just need the right job. Or you just need that right relationship. Or you just need a little bit more money in your pocket. And then you'll be happy. And then you'll be satisfied. And we have bought the lies of our world when the world says we can provide happiness through that relationship or that substance or that job or that paycheck. And we buy into the lie of our world in, with their method and their means on how they think they should provide. David says, no, the, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want anything. I lack nothing. If I don't ever get married, if I don't ever find that right, perfect job, if I don't ever meet that financial paycheck, if all I have is me and Jesus at the end of the day, I have all that I need. This is, oh, come on now. Come on now. Come, can I get a, a couple more amens here? Thank you, Caleb. I have all that I need, but our culture and our world tries to tell us how to be happy in other people and in other things, and we go with the sway of culture. When David says, I don't need anything else, I have me and Jesus. Now, I'm not saying don't get married and marriage is wrong. I'm married and I'm having a great time. Marriage is great, okay? I'm not saying don't pursue your dreams. I'm not saying to not make money. Okay, the Bible doesn't say that money is wrong. It says the love of money is wrong, but making money is something, working is something that God has given us the ability to do. So pursue your dreams and, and, and work hard and make money. And if you want, be married. It's great. Try it. It's great. It's fun. But if you seek those things as means to ultimate fulfillment, they will leave you dry. If you seek relationship or you think that marriage is going to completely fill me up and satisfy me, if you think that that paycheck or that job or that girlfriend or boyfriend is going to meet that ultimate need, let me just tell you, it will leave you completely dry. And David knows this and he says, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. I've got everything that I need. Here's another example with this leadership quality where David says, the Lord leads me. My concern is for our young adult generation that we have allowed different people or different things to be our shepherd in this regard of leadership. That we have allowed the noise of the culture or the advice from bad friends to influence our decisions. Leadership has to do with influence. And the noise of the culture on social media or the news can be so loud at times, it makes wrong sound like right. And we buy into the leadership of our culture and the leadership sometimes and the influence of bad friends that we've surrounded ourselves with. So when they give us advice on how to date or how to vote or how to view the world or how to behave, we have given over the right to different people in our lives that have no business giving us advice or counsel and we have given bad people or bad friends. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying don't be friends with bad people. Okay, We're all bad people. There's only one good person, and that's Jesus Christ. And so bad people need Jesus. But if you surround yourself 
with bad people to the point, you know, Psalm says, uh, Proverbs says, bad company corrupts good morals. So a lot of, a lot of the time we have surrounded ourselves with people who don't know Christ, don't care to know Christ, and will give you advice contrary to biblical counsel. And so the noise of the culture is as well. And we have allowed the culture and the advice from bad friends to be our leaders. David says, no, with God as my shepherd, I'm giving him the authority to lead me. And not only lead me, but to lead me in righteous living, verse 3 says. To lead me in paths of righteousness. To lead me in the way that pleases and that honors the Lord. So lead me, Lord. So how does that look practically? Well, you've got to know your Bibles. You've got to know your Bibles, church. Get into God's Word and see what He says about culture. See what He says about us. And see what He says about how to honor Him. But you've got to get into His Word and you've got to know the Word. Because ultimately, He wants to lead me towards righteous living. And then when it comes to restoring the soul, a characteristic of our Good Shepherd, He restores our soul. My concern is with our world... And with our culture, that we have allowed other things or other people the right to fill us back up, the right to restore us, when in actuality it is a deceptive uh, cure. It's a deceptive method. David says, I don't run to any other means or any other substances. I go to the Lord to fully restore my soul. So another defining characteristic with the Lord as my shepherd is that I go to Him to be restored. David speaks of this filling up process that God desires to do. When you're down or when you're discouraged or when you're feeling dry, when you're feeling spiritually empty, go to the Lord. You know, one of my biggest fears is uh, running out of gas on the highway. Anybody else share that fear? Am I all alone? It's one of my biggest fears, running out of gas on the highway, or probably honestly what's worse, one of my biggest fears is running out of gas in the middle of the drive through when there's a long line behind me. Oh my goodness, because I don't want to be that idiot in the drive through line after I've ordered and my car just totally conks out and I've got 20 people behind me and I just, you know, I, that's, my, that's my fear. So you know how to pray for me now, okay? Pray for me in this regard. Just pray that I have a full tank at, at all times, okay? It's 15 bucks, 20 bucks to get you at least halfway there. But for whatever reason, I just, I always let the, uh, the gas light come on and let it ding and kind of just lazy like that, so... And we're all sheep. We're sheep. Okay, we're dumb. I'm dumb. And I need a full tank of gas, and that's one of my biggest fears. But that's kind of the imagery I draw up in my head, in my mind, when David says, you know, when you're feeling dry, when you're feeling empty, when you're fearing, feeling spiritually run out, go to the Lord to be restored. You know, there are different remedies for when you're running low. Okay, so when you're running low on physical energy, all right, they tell you, you know, eat a protein bar, drink some water, uh, drink some Gatorade when you're running low on physical energy. All right, when you're running low on mental energy, there's something called caffeine. So running low, running dry on some mental focus, a you know, little bit of caffeine sometimes does the trick. Here's a question for you. What well source, okay, what well source do you run to when you're spiritually empty? So when you're physical, physically empty, there's a remedy. Eat some food, drink some water. Mentally, you know, drink some cafe, whatever, ca caffeine. Drink, don't drink a whole cafe. Okay, drink some caffeine. But when you're emotionally dry, when you're spiritually dry, and yes, mentally and physically as well, what well source do you run to to fill you back up? Do not allow the world to shepherd you in this area. Do not allow the world to shepherd you in this area. Because the well source of the world says, have another shot. The well source of the world says, take another drink. The well source of the world says, have another puff. You know, I had a friend years ago who, you know, he was just discouraged and he was kind of just opening up to me. And he said, you know, when, I, when I'm anxious or when I'm stressed, uh, I drink. Uh, when I want to enhance my mood... I drink. If that's you, do not do that. You know that alcohol is a depressant. Alcohol is a depressant. Don't do that. 
because you're training the chemicals in your brain to, co to find comfort and restoration in something outside the Holy Spirit. But we as believers are called to find restoration in Him. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Many people go to alcohol to relax or to enhance their mood. Alcohol is a depressant. This is what uh, AddictionCenter.com says. Drinking profoundly alters an individual's mood, behavior, and neuropsychological functioning. For many people, alcohol consumption is a means of relaxation. However, the effects of alcohol can actually induce anxiety and increase stress. Alcohol is classified as a central nervous system depressant. I'm going to say that again. Alcohol is classified as a central nervous system depressant, meaning that it slows down brain functioning, neural activity. Alcohol can depress the central nervous system so much that it results in impairment, such as slurred speech, unsteady movement, disturbed uh, perceptions, and inability to react quickly. Mentally, alcohol reduces an individual's ability to think rationally, lessens inhibitions, and distorts judgment. Okay, the Bible says to be sober-minded so that you can be alert, so that you can be aware of the devil's schemes. How can I be sober-minded if when I want to relax and want to be at ease and enhance my mood, I don't run to the Lord to restore me and to fill me, but I run to a substance? I'm not here to necessarily bash on alcohol. The Bible prohibits drunkenness. It doesn't necessarily prohibit drinking, but I will tell you, that the book of Proverbs has a, uh, 11 things to say about alcohol. Nine of those 11 things, it's always a warning against it. I've never had someone come into my office or my dad's office saying about how alcohol has improved their spiritual life. Okay? And this is a deception of the world, I believe, that says if you're dry, if you're feeling a little bit low, have another drink. A lie of the world. Don't believe it. Here's another way the world and many Christians attempt to restore the soul. And I might step on some toes with this one. So I'm going to make us a little bit uncomfortable here, but I believe in equality, so I'm going to make us all uncomfortable. Uh, a lot of Christians and a, a lot of the world, to restore their soul and to find inner peace, yoga. Okay? Stepping on some toes here. I am well aware. Austin, why do you gotta be, why you gotta be so legalistic? Okay, alcohol's one thing, but don't mess with my yoga. Please, stay away from my poses. Please. Okay, but I believe yoga is something that people run to as a way to find inner peace. Austin, are you against stretching? Are you against exercise? No. I'm not against stretching, I'm not against exercise, okay, but a little bit about yoga. Yoga is rooted in Hinduism. Its roots are in Hinduism. Okay, there's no creator, there's no creation. We don't go out to the Lord to find peace, we go inward to find peace. The Bible never says to go inward to find peace. The Bible always encourages us to go outward to the Lord. Yoga is not about being, uh, there's no creators, no creation. It's all about being one with the universe through meditation. I want to be one with the Lord through the mediator, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but yoga talks about being one with the universe through meditation, uh, being uh, at one with uh, the universe going inward to find some kind of inner peace going into self. The Bible never prescribes to that as a method of restoring the soul. We go outward to the Lord to find peace, to find restoration, to be filled back up. We're not trying to be one with creation. We're trying to be one with the Lord and reconciled back to God through Christ. I'm done with yoga, okay. But one of the attributes David recognizes about God as his shepherd is that God is the one who can fill him when he's dry, to restore him when he's on empty, to meet all of his needs. So when the world presents different means or different methods, to find ultimate rest or to find different modes of peace. The Bible has one mode to find that peace or to find that restoration, and it is going to the Lord, it's running to His Word, it's studying Scripture, it's reading from the Psalms, it is praying, it is surrounding yourself with like-minded believers who, in, who can encourage you. We don't find peace in ourselves, we find peace in the Lord. 
We become one with the Lord when we're reconciled back to Him through our relationship with Jesus. This is how David recognizes his restoration. Real quickly, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Two more characteristics about Jesus, about God as our Jehovah Rohi. He protects and he directs. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through dark valleys, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Hebrew word for rod is shebet, and it simply means a stick, and it would have been used as a tool to fend off predators. So a rod was something to protect the sheep. David says, God, you protect me. And then the Hebrew word for staff, it's mishenah, and it's a tool used to round up the flock. You've seen a shepherd's staff. I brought one out a couple weeks ago, and it has a crook on the end of it. And if a, sh a sheep was going off course or straying from the flock, the shepherd would use it to direct the sheep back to the flock. He would put the crook of the shepherd's staff around uh, its neck and bring it back into the fold. And that's what the Lord does with us. When we're doing our best to walk in obedience, but we make a poor decision, or we're so stressed out about the will of the Lord, and so we take this job and we're stressing about it because we don't know if it's the Lord's will. Okay, the Lord is gracious to us. And if He sees us going outside the fold, a part of His nature as our shepherd is to direct us and to protect us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know what valley you may have experienced in your life. But let me tell you that the Lord as our great shepherd, He desires to protect you and direct you and to guide you. And verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. David says, You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. This was always symbolic imagery of blessing. An anointing of the head. So the Lord desires to bless. You know, something I find within Christian life is sometimes we think that God is frustrated or angry with us. And sometimes he rightly is frustrated or angered by our sin. In that case, repent and turn from your sin. But the Lord, you have to see the Lord as a shepherd, as a father who desires to bless you as his kids. You know, Jesus in the Gospels, he says, you, though you are good parents, know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more does your heavenly father desire to give good gifts to him who asks? And in Luke, he defines what that good gift is, and he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? You know, the God of the Bible, when we think of the God, of, especially of the Old Testament, we think of an angry God who hates people and wants to kill people. Okay, the God of the Bible was angered at people's sin because he is so holy, and he wants us as his kids to take sin seriously as well. But his overall character and his nature is to bless you as his kids. Because a good dad loves you and wants to provide for you. He's not a killjoy. He doesn't want to withhold good and blessing from you. The only time you might feel him withholding blessing from you is because that's not what's best for you. Even though in our limited mindset, we think, well, God, why are you not giving me this or that? Sometimes he just says, that's not the right person. Or he might say, that's not the right timing. But he loves to bless his kids. David says, you anoint my head with oil so much that my cup runs over. My cup runs over. And then lastly, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David recognizes God as his shepherd, as someone who desires to dwell with him, to have an intimate relationship with him for all of eternity. You know, another translation of this word, Rohi, Jehovah Rohi, another translation for Rohi means friend or companion. And so this indicates the intimacy God desires between himself and his people. So when the two words are combined, Jehovah Rohi, it can actually translate as the Lord, my friend, the Lord, my companion. Do you know the Lord tonight as your friend or as your companion? Jesus, he told his disciples before he left, he said, I no longer call you servants, for a servant doesn't know his master's work, but I call you my friends. 
That's the Lord's heart for you. The creator of the universe wants a friendship with you? Absolutely. He desires that you submit your life to him and make him your shepherd in order that you live with him forever. And the beautiful thing, this is the last thing I'll say, the beautiful thing is that in the Old Testament, when we've been walking through these different names, you can always find a parallel to how Jesus identified himself in the Gospels. And this is one way that Jesus identified himself. He said in John 10, 14 through 15, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. It's what our shepherd did for us. He loved you so much that he laid down his life for you. Even though in your dirt and in your fear, in your lack of direction, the Lord as our great shepherd sent his son to die for us on the cross, to lay down his life for the sheep. And then in verse 27 in that same chapter, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. When I was in Israel, um, a couple years ago, I was in Israel with my dad. It was on our, one of our church tours. And it was this really cool scene. There was uh, two different flocks of sheep. So two different shepherds and two different flocks of sheep. And uh, the one shepherd, you know, both of the flocks were mixed. Um, so you couldn't, you couldn't tell whose flock was who, but you just know there are two shepherds here, so there's probably two different flocks here. But the different sheep were all intermingled, so there was no distinction between the two different flocks. And then one of the shepherds, he called out in Hebrew, obviously. He called out in Hebrew, and he called out to his sheep. And he started walking. And what do you know that when he called out to his specific flock, even though they were all intermingled, his flock left that flock and went with their shepherd. The first thing I thought was, I can't believe these sheep know Hebrew. And the second thing I thought was, this is amazing. This is exactly what Jesus says in the Gospels, that my sheep know my voice and I know them. So my question for you tonight is, do you know the Lord's voice? Do you belong to his fold? Do you belong to his flock? Have you submitted to your life unto the great shepherd who desires to provide, who desires to protect, who desires to direct, who desires to bless you, who desires to lead you? Have you submitted your life as one of his sheep saying, God, I want to make you my shepherd? Not just for all these benefits that in life I don't have to walk alone, but in life I know that you're my shepherd, that you're going to lead, that you're going to provide, that you're going to guide. All the questions I have about my future and my marriage and my job and my relationships and my paychecks. Lord, you're my great shepherd. I'm going to submit to you and trust that you're going to take care of my life. But not only that, David, David ends with, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because when you make Jesus your chief shepherd, there are benefits here on life for sure because you're not alone now. But the ultimate blessing is when you get to dwell in his presence for all of eternity. And if you don't know him tonight as your shepherd, I want to give you that opportunity as we pray. And as we pray, I'm just going to lead you in a quick prayer. And I want you to take that opportunity to make Jesus your shepherd so that you don't have to be alone here on earth, but that even more importantly, you get to be with him for all of eternity. And you will then know his voice and he will know you. And so I pray that you make that decision tonight if you haven't, and if you have, be encouraged by this name Jehovah Rohi and know that the Lord desires to lead and guide and provide and protect and be with you during this challenging season of COVID and the different challenges of our country, but just generally as you're walking through life, each day of the week, wake up and know it is good to know that I have a shepherd and that I'm not alone. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we come before you tonight, and right now I just want to open up the opportunity for those of you who have not made a decision to make God the Lord of your life, to make God the shepherd over your life. Here's your opportunity right now. Today's the day of salvation. 
And so I'm just going to go slowly in this prayer. There's nothing magical about the prayer. It's all about your, your heart and your attitude towards the Lord. But if you haven't made this decision, just repeat after me just quietly to yourself, Dear Jesus, I'm tired and I am dry and I pray that you would fill me. I surrender my life and I make you Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that I could have new life in Him. In Jesus' name. And for the rest of us who already know the Lord is our Savior, I just pray, Lord, a special protection and blessing over this flock tonight. We are the sheep of your pasture, and it is good to know that we have a shepherd who cares for us, who loves us, and who desires to lead us, who desires to restore us and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. So fill us, Lord. If any of us have come in dry tonight, fill us again, Lord, with your Spirit. Just make us alive in the Lord and give us the joy of our salvation. Fill us up with your Spirit, Lord, and, and lead us as we do our best to walk with you. Guide and direct us when we take steps outside your will. We trust that you're good and that you will be with us in life, Lord. Thank you for being our Jehovah Rohi. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.